start with some of those uh, previous festivals. Wallacea, was that the first one after Woodstock here? No, Arimba was the first. Arimba. That, that was um, fairly low-key, extremely hippie, um, but worked reasonably well. I don't think it made much money. Uh, but it sort of built the momentum. And then the following year in 1971, and remember, Arimba is only scant months after Woodstock, mm -hmm. uh, we have um, Maiponga in Adelaide and Wallachia in Sydney, and both successful festivals, even though uh, at Wallachia, you know, the festival started on Friday night and they finished the first toilets on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> uh, there were some issues with it, but I think the bands had a, a good time. It was musically very successful. Uh, and then we have Sunbury and uh, my Sunbury and the Meadows Technicolor Fair in 1972. The last big festival was Marwala in 1972, and thereafter uh, Sunbury carried the flag for the festival movement. So the, the Meadows Technicolor was a week after, or was it the no, it was on same, the same weekend? Same weekend as Sunbury. A lot of the bands played Sunbury, got in their cars or um, uh, panel vans and drove straight to Adelaide. Right. And Black Sabbath, was it? did they play at that one? They or? played at My Ponga. They played the at My before. Ponga, right. And that was at a great big uh, paddock somewhere. A, far, a farm, farm outside of Adel out of Adelaide. Yeah. yeah, and financed by Hamish Henry, who... Yeah. The idea came from Alex Innocenti, yep. who was a very well-known promoter in Adelaide. I know Alex very yep. well. Mm -hmm. And Hamish Henry was, uh, he financed or an Adelaide band at the time, which had Bon Scott, uh, uncle who played harp uh, for a band called Fraternity. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like, like so many bands of that period, um, heavily influenced by the band in America, which, you know, I heard music yeah. from Big Pink in 1969 and it changed my whole view of music. Yeah. Now, Mike, you had an interest. In, there was another local one. Was that 1971 or was it 1970? Um, launching Place? Launching Place, yes. That was, a, that was run by Michael Browning, but uh, apparently it had rained at that site every day on this particular day since uh, time immemorial and uh, unfortunately the pattern continued. Now that was at a place off Don... On the Don Road, Don launching Road. place. Yeah, and it was a farm as well, was it? Yeah, it was yep. called the Miracle Festival. Yes. Uh, they only got it going um, <laughs> through really intense opposition uh, and got round the, um, the regulations by charging for camping instead of the music. Yeah. Now... So it was rain. It did get started. It, well, it was raining at the start, right? And, and uh, there were attempts to get the music started, and, and I think they they were quite courageous because the uh, it was raining very heavily, and the coverage on the stage was not good. In fact, I think at one stage they ripped the the coverings off the toilets and to try and put them over the stage and uh, keep people dry. But there was a lot of a lot of rain, and at sometimes there was some thunder and lightning as well. So it, it wasn't a good start. I think Chain had a crack at it, and Wendy Sandington might have had a crack at it as well. Yeah, Rob McKenzie, uh, really I know, frizzy. played. Sorry. Rob McKenzie played yeah, in yeah, a Rob band. Yeah, yeah, Is that yeah. McKenzie theory? theory? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's a wonderful player mm. still. Mm. Yeah. Playing with Shana Nara in the States at the moment. So, Mike, you were there. Spectrum were ready to play that that day. You were at the festival. We were we were there, uh, but I don't think I ventured outside uh, the mini moak that I was in, which was leaking, of course, uh, through the through the entire day. And in the end, we just went home. And then next year, we came back and did exactly the same thing. Oh, really? They had another crack at they had it. Another crack at it. Two oh. years in a row. I want to bring this story up, and you've told this to my previous listeners before about I'll Be Gone, the single I'll Be Gone, and how it came about from the very beginnings. We can trace that beginnings back to that festival, the to launching place. place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, because um, the it, what ended up by being the B-side of, of I'll Be Gone, launching place part two, because I had launching place part one and part two, which I thought I'd write um, because we, uh, we belonged, uh, Spectrum belonged to this stable for Let It Be 
agency, which Michael Browning was involved with at that stage. And uh, they came up with the idea. And Bill actually went with, I think, uh, some members of Chain to see the site. It was already uh, a swamp at that stage. <laughs> um, and uh, But I thought, well, this is a chance to write something that will actually get played. So I, I wrote the instrumental and, and I wrote uh, a rather scathing preview of what you know, a, a festival could be, right. and um, which didn't mention rain, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we went into the studios uh, at Armstrong Studio, 100 uh, Albert Street, uh, Albert Park Road, sorry, and met up with Howard Gable, who was just over from New Zealand, where he'd had some success as a producer, and he and I kind of um, placed him in Melbourne for the moment, because essentially they were a, a Sydney outfit. Mm -hmm. And so he was acting as A&R guy and producer. So he ended up in the studio with us, and we recorded Launching Place Parts 1 and 2, and if I could actually have a mental picture of him, he was probably pull, pulling out his hair at that stage and said, have you got anything else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I said, well, yes. And it actually song. came to my mind uh, because we'd done a rehearsal with uh, – and Ross Wilson had come along to the rehearsal because he'd just come back from the UK where he'd been playing with Precision. Precision, yeah. He'd written uh, Make or Stash. So he gave us Make or Stash – and, and then he listened to some of the rest of the rehearsal. And when we came to I'll Be Gone, he went, yeah, that's the one, tapped his nose up here for thinking. And um, so I had that endorsement from you know, somebody else, but I already knew that it was uh, uh, had potential because we were playing it at our gigs and it was the one song that got uh, a, a reaction out of people. And particularly since I'd added the harmonica to it because it, when I started playing it, it uh, didn't, didn't have it, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I wanted to go back to Peter about the very first Sunbury, 1972, and just uh, like the logistics and uh, the staging and the lighting and everything that went into it. But well, it, it was kind of like building a city in a paddock somewhere. You had to put in everything, roads, communications, water, um, toilets, etc. Everything that would go into a small town had to be built in... A matter of about six weeks in a paddock at Digger's Rest. I was lucky at that point I'd resigned from Channel 9. I was just, I was doing little lighting gigs around uh, Melbourne and uh, I was able to be at the site and see everything being built and I took a lot of slides, many of which are in the book mm. and they've kind of followed me around for, you know, 40 years thinking should I throw these out and I, in the end I'm glad I didn't uh, because a lot of them made it into the book. Yeah. But there was a lot of money spent. The festival got going against intense opposition, the establishment in Melbourne. Uh, and for that, you can read Henry Bolte and Arthur Ryler uh, didn't want the festival to go ahead. And the tool they used to try and stop it was Brigadier Eason of the CFA, who came out and said that, you know, thousands were going to be burnt to death. The local C CFA had have none of that. They knew the precautions that had been taken. Uh, they knew that... Um, that Jackson's Creek acted as a fire break. They knew everything had been mown. And the captain of the br brigade came out on television and contradicted his boss in Melbourne and actually saved the festival. But uh, uh, being counterculture, the festivals of the time, if you told uh, young people not to go, they were going to go anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And the Duncans the, that had the property, they... The Duncans were a fantastic family, um, very youth-oriented. They um, ran dances and, and in the local area and uh, they were very keen to have the festival on their site and it was a perfect site too. It was, uh, we went out there to pick the site for the stage and, and with the, the backdrop of the hills behind it, the long slope to the stage, the flats to either side for... Uh, Camping and um, and backup facilities, plenty of level room and good road access for car parking. It was about as perfect as you could get for a for a festival site. It was a, like a real amphitheater with that the hills and the stage right in front of the hills. It was, yeah, yeah it was fantastic. And uh, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs were organised to come out, um, and uh, we shot some promo material there. Um, uh, just stills 
uh, wearing bigger than big T-shirts, which was the theme of the first festival. Okay, yeah. Uh, and that appeared in, in Go Set and various other music newspapers. So uh, it, the momentum, you know, built quite well. The Duncans didn't get much for actually, as the, like the rental for the the farm, is that right? No, they got, they got infrastructure. They got a road put in down to the okay. flats, which they didn't have before. Yep. Uh, they had some tanks put in um, uh, at the top of the hill. Uh, they had a lot of rocks cleared um, from off the site because it's a very stony site. Uh, and that's what they were paid for. They, they got that little bit of infrastructure. Yeah. Now, the first... It was Friday uh, afternoon was the start, wasn't it? The, the people arriving and there were there were already put lots of people there on Friday afternoon. And the first music was played was um, uh, Billy Thorpe and Lobby Lloyd and uh, Bruce Howard on acoustic guitars down by the riverbank, and they just sat down and started playing. And a crowd grew around them, and it it lasted for about I guess half an hour, and it was a very peaceful and very hippified start to the to the festival it was really great but then you know people were flooding into the site and i think by friday night they already had their expected attendance of fifteen thousand, and of course by saturday it was thirty thousand mm. plus mm. so there was no acts uh, set down for that particular friday evening and that's when they sort of got that jam or where it was going yeah well i'd i'd done all the light focusing on um, back in the days when we didn't have moving lights. Uh, that was all done on the Thursday night. So we were ready on the Friday. Jans were ready with the PA system on the Friday because they'd set up on the Friday afternoon and set and tuned everything. And I think it was Graham Morgan that that, um, that led the charge mm. uh, to set up a jam on stage. Uh, some bands you know, as did play as bands, but I remember one huge jam that lasted for hours and that really set the scene for the uh, for the first, first festival. Yeah. Mike, when did you play on that first uh, Sunbury? Uh, uh, no use asking me. <laughs> <laughs> no memory? <laughs> no, well, in, in fact, um, we, we spent as much time as we had to on the site and then fled to a gig in back in town. So what Peter's saying is, is true, that bands were, were driving um, long distances to get to Sunbury, play and then move on to Melbourne and play there and then move on somewhere else probably yeah. and play there. So um, the, the business of playing in those days was, was a business and we were, we were running hither and thither um, and Sunbury was part of that. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember what we did and when we did it <laughs> at that Sunbury, the next Sunbury, possibly the next or the next, whichever <laughs> one we missed out, and then the last one. Right. It's, is there anything that sticks in? Because I, I wanted to get up onto the, the sort of hippie festival, which everyone expected it to be. Uh, this is saying something about brown rice. Uh, uh, mm. Well, yeah, you know, peace, love, and, and mung right. beans. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I think everyone expected Sunbury to continue the the hippiness, but things had changed subtly. Um, the music had changed. Um, the stimulus of choice uh, had moved on from a herb to uh, alcohol. Mm. Well, I think that was, that was an Australian cultural thing, wasn't it? Because it, you look at movies like. Woodstock and, and Monterey in particular, mm. that it was very herbal. Yes. And that's that's the part that I thought was going to happen, but it, it didn't. Me too. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was I was expecting that. And I know Billy thought was expecting that because, you know, he brought along a, a little plastic tent and, you know, yeah. he was going to camp on site and all of that. But um, not only had the scale of the thing changed, but the vibe had changed yes. as well. It, indeed, yeah. And in your book, you mention, or I think Mike, one of Mike's comments, and I think it came from Thorpey uh, on stage, uh, the the uh, suck more piss uh, chant. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that that was the reality, though. I mean, yeah. that's what you were confronted with: a, a, an audience that was basically grogging on. Yeah, uh, th there was a pervasive smell of herbs, but uh, <laughs> but uh, in fact, uh, yes. Not uh, looking at anyone there. That kind of, <laughs> you didn't need a sniffer dog. No, right. It kind of ran out. Um, 
over the over the days, and and Grog was the only logical replacement. Mm. And I, I was saying before that the, the first summary you could take a slab or more than a slab in. The second summary you're allowed to take a six pack in, and by the third summary you purchased the cans there, and they had to be open, and it was a two can limit, and it cost you thirty cents, and you could recycle it for half a cent. And they also became very good instruments. They did. I mean, probably the key uh, thing was um, Piranha's Soul Sacrifice. And I remember from Wallachia, and I've got film of it, of people banging cans together. And, of course, uh, Thorpey capitalised that on the first Sunbury, you know, come on, bang your cans together. So it became a percussion instrument. So let's let's go to... I, I talked to Matt Taylor last week on the show and uh, as a, a, an intro or leading to this, this week's show, I, I asked him a question about his uh, Sunbury experience and he mainly played as a uh, solo act. He said he was mainly a solo act but did do... I think Chain Band might have backed him a couple yes, of times. Yep. And also he, he mentioned a guy, uh, it was a New Zealand uh, drummer who was an actor. Bruno? Bruno, Bruno, yes. Bruno Lawrence, yeah. Yeah, and he jammed with whatever band he w- was with there one year. But his main memory was uh, Rainbury or Mudbury with the people sliding down while he was playing. And he wrote a song on a, an album uh, where he mentions it in it was one of his later albums. But uh, I'm sort of going to go back a bit because there were lessons learnt and there were lessons learnt from the very early festivals in, in Australia. But from each festival, there were things learnt and improved on. And then that was, a, well, I don't know, I, we'll say a failure, but I don't know whether it was a total failure, but that, that was the last one. There wasn't another one after that and the rain did have an effect. But I'll, I'll throw that over you, Peter, and... And, and the lessons learnt and what happened in that last one? Before the first Sunbury Festival, they'd established that, in fact, the site was a rain shadow area. And the Duncan's theory was that the westerlies coming over the Yuyangs split the uh, weather and it very r- rarely rained on that particular farm. And now they'd had from day one rain insurance. If you've got if you're a professional organisation and you're running a big event, you'll have rain insurance. The problem was that the rain gauge on which that rain insurance was based was in at Rupert's Wood at Sunbury, and it was uh, raining at the festival. It wasn't raining at Rupert's Wood. So they couldn't claim on their rain insurance. Mm. Now, if they'd got the, the, the crowd that they did intend to get, the festival would have made money or at the very minimum broke even. Uh, there was a Melbourne radio station, which was the only rock and roll station at that time, and it had rained on the Friday night, um, but it had eased off on the Saturday morning. Now, this particular station kept uh, broadcasting, despite the fact that Odessa were ringing them up, that it was still raining at Sunbury when it wasn't, and that must have had some impact on the attendances as well. Mm. Um, so it was unfortunate that they'd spent a lot of money on Deep Purple, not only on the band's fee, but bringing their gear out. Um, And that was why Sunbury went under. So it was, if if the attendances had been there, if it hadn't been raining, then the festival probably would have broken even and it might have continued. Yeah, you say might have continued. Do you think it would have continued? I think the flavour was going off it. Um, Mm. It had started out out as counterculture, Yes. It had become commercial. Absolutely. The hippie vibe had faded and the, the suck more piss theme was in. We also had the uh, problem with Sharpies turning up. Um, you know, it was a Sharpie time and, and in fact, Lobby Lloyd got down on his knees and pleaded to be, uh, to, to be allowed to play at one of the later festivals um, but was told no because you attract the Sharpies. Yeah. Uh, so that was an issue. The first three Sunburys were all non-violent. Um, towards the end, though, there was that overture of violence coming in from bikies and sharpies. Um, and I think no one wanted to see another Altamont where, you know, someone was stabbed by a Hell's Angel. I think it, it might have continued. It had to change. John Fowler was pushing it in the, um, 
in the direction of the Reading Festival. So there was a second stage mm. with poetry, ballet, jazz, those sorts of things. And it was moving away from rock and roll. And the Reading Festivals are still going. Mm. Um, and I think that's been the secret to the success, that there's something for a much wider audience than just the, the hard rock aficionado. So, yes, there were changes happening all the time. Sunbury was attempting to move with those times and meet those changes, but was unable to do so because uh, there was no money from that last festival to run another one. Uh, was it that last festival that they changed the security uh, of that festival? Was there? A- yeah, the first three had been Bob Jones, and Bob Jones was very well respected around all of the venues in Melbourne and the Bob Jones guys had smiley face T-shirts and they were the same age as most of the punters, but uh, much better able to handle themselves in a scrap. I don't know whether that had any real impact on it. 